How are you guys doing? We're talking Talladega in this one. Now, I apologize that I am in the dark ages, but I'm recording this Monday night um, only because I want to get this out, you know, probably Tuesday morning. And I have a few thoughts. This may be more of a, I mean, clearly second half, at least like last half of this will, will very much be like, hey guys, you might want to stack the back and stuff. Um, but I want to talk about Talladega and the possible changes that NASCAR is implementing. Now, this is speculative on my part as we have not heard anything at the moment Tuesday. I mean, you know, this is Monday night. We haven't heard anything from it. But I would kind of just want to speak out loud about how things might go. I want to talk about Atlanta really fast and what, or, and, and what I saw in person, and I just kind of want to talk about this. So this may be more of a, you know, kind of an old schooler, like Brandon Cruz Daily Fantasy podcast video versus a Talladega preview, because um, the preview is just stacked back. But um, where I'm at, there's quite a lot of things that I, that I want to discuss. And so first and foremost, let's talk about Atlanta very quickly. Now, there's a situation, or at least there was a situation, to where, you know, Hamlin was chalk in the back of the field. And the reason I want to bring this up is because typically what I have noticed um, over the course of really folks on ownership and looking at ownership, the likelihood, or not the likelihood, but the outcome of stack the back drivers and lineups working and being prevalent and stuff and then when those types of lineups don't work or people are biased or things happen late in a race, we typically don't see the field correct nearly as much as when, you know, the optimal is a full stack from the back weekend or whatever. And then you see the next couple of races, you see it, you see a slight uptick in that, you know, in those types of styles and those types of builds and whatnot. And then it goes... Um, back down. Actually, let me just take a quick look really fast to see if we have a, um, if, the, if we have the contest size up for Sunday. So it is only 8,000 people because we did, we failed to fill the one on Sunday. Uh, and I believe we were still like a thousand people short, um, this past Sunday for the cup series race at Kansas. And so yet again, when we're looking at 8,000 people, we don't have to get as crazy as as usual but still i think it's a good uh precedent to, to, to stack in the back and whatnot. anyway i want to talk about this uh atlanta race very fast because as i said i was there and uh typically youtube does not like when i go back and show you know stuff uh, you know from a broadcast or whatever because it's you know it's like oh it's copyrighted content but at least uh, since i recorded my own stuff um i can go ahead and um, show this not worry about stuff being taken down now this is now i just took this as an example now this happened to be the end of stage two at atlanta but it showed a lot of the things that i was noticing at the track and i want to take a step back i really believe that like you know say if you were like mclovin or somebody who was like rich or stuff i honestly think if you just bit the bullet and decided to travel for every NASCAR weekend and, like, bought, like, a suite or rented a suite or whatever, um, I think you could probably kill NASCAR DFS. Like, I think you could actually have a way bigger advantage um, by going and watching how the races play out in person because we're so limited on TV, and TV doesn't necessarily show, doesn't necessarily show us the types of things that we're wanting to see, especially in, like, an Atlanta race, something like this. And so... Um, this is off a long green flag run. I mean, we are 46 laps into this race and I'm bringing this up because people are typically worried about slower cars losing the pack. And yes, this does happen in Xfinity and stuff as well, but still it's even, it's not as drastic as it used to be just because we don't have all the bad teams in here. And it's usually more apparent at a place like Atlanta because yeah, sure. It's 1.5 instead of 2.5 miles, but with the, you know, decrease in RPMs that you have in the corners, if you have a slow car, you typically fall off the pack pretty fast. And one thing that we're noticing is that, or at least I'm noticing, rather, looking at both the trucks and Xfinity at Atlanta and, you know, Cup Series as well, is that when they fall off the pack, we typically still have clusters of people. It's very rare that you have a driver by themselves fall off the pack and lose uh, the pack in, in situations like that. I also want to add that, like, Denny Hamlin, as I said, he was high chalk, and a lot of people were, like, super pissed off that he, like, failed, right? Um, 
but the way I look at it is, look, that's how races are going to go. He inter, which you got to truly highly respect Hamlin for it. I love the approach. He said it was. He said he was doing it before the race. I thought it was a great play, and I certainly in a situation like this, to where when somebody enters a race, telling you that they're going to ride and wait for the crashes, that is the best DFS approach you can do especially as someone starting from the back of the field, okay? Now, what happened in this race was that, hey, Volatility, uh, Randomness, they didn't crash, and they had a lot of single car and small spins and stuff. You know, you had uh, Larson and Chase Briscoe early, you had Noah Gregson late, but we really didn't have the crashes, although we came close uh, quite a few times, we just didn't have the crashes, and that's just how plate racing works out. Sometimes you have races that wreck out and have a lot of wrecks other races you don't whatever the case may be but i want to show you you know where these guys are at now yet again this is at the end of a stage and we're, we don't have a pack as dangerous as other tracks so yeah sure drivers in the backfield you could argue that they may be riding more in this sense because this is two to go but i want to add that i believe this is hamlin i just clicked this video i mean hamlin is in the back of the field i'm pretty sure this is hamlin right here it could be let's see if i can find him as he comes through this is hamlin right here um so when you're when we're looking back at the field, like you have the basically like, you know, some of the legacy cars um, and some of the slower cars, whether it was like Collie or whoever the, you know, the slowest teams were at the time, Hamlin rode in the back and was not there because he was slow, was not there because he was handling bad. He was able to make any adjustments he wanted to as Atlanta is more of a setup type of track now as we're seeing that this car specifically handling is coming more into play especially with the fact that we can bring back two car tandems the fact that we can bring back pushes having huge runs and stuff handling is a huge part of it now the reason i'm bringing this up is that when we look at the back of the field okay yet again this is after a 40 lap run okay whether this is the end of stage or not like this is as far back as the slowest car has got okay now at talladega you run into a situation, yeah, sure, you know, it's a longer straightaway, and it might be a situation where they lose the pack a bit more, but still, I'm not necessarily concerned about people falling a lap down, and if they do, it's typically going to be within a group of cars, either it's in a pit stop, or if they just go long or whatever, and, you know, um, I'm not very concerned about that. Even in situations for, like, Xfinity and Truck, we really haven't had to worry about Multiple people, multiple people going a lap down before the end of stage one or stage two. Now, the truck series is only like 85 laps on Friday. I'm sure that's just going to be a fucking shit show uh, because the fucking stages are going to take away like seven laps each. You know, we're going to go green for like a quarter of a lap and then the stage ends or whatever. Like Friday's race is going to be chaotic. Um, but I'm not really concerned about people falling off through the pack anymore. Now, you might argue that the... 76 in the truck series the 22 they like the Reum brothers the uh you know freedom racing like yeah sure those slower trucks yeah sure they're gonna be slow or whatever but still it's not as aggressive as it used to be so like that's that's the one thing of note that i wanted to bring up i also want to bring up just the fact that like this is hamlin like riding right like hamlin never lost the pack hamlin like never fell off or anything like that he rode you know at the end of the pack waiting for the wreck all day like you would really want somebody to do so if you were complaining about hamlin like oh hamlin cha fucking sucks this is fucking boomer he's pissed himself at this racetrack not doing anything like that just stupid okay he did nothing wrong we just didn't have a crash which like hello first time you know that that meme uh you know what that you know when those guys are about to be hanged like oh, first time like is this your first time you stack the back and they didn't wreck like hello that's that's just part of what happens but when we look at how these guys are racing right and you can see that you know they're staying on top of each other but it's super super difficult to get runs at atlanta now i would argue in terms of now yet again i would bring I would remove Atlanta from the data pool, but I think you'd learn a lot about who's a good plate racer and who's not a good plate racer by what current Atlanta is doing, especially if you're able to re, um, not even re, uh, if you're able to match what you did in the spring. Look at this fucking pavement. This is wild. Um, but like, look at all the guys up top, right? Like all the guys up front. It's teams. It's good drivers. It's the people that are good plate racers. Okay. Now, yet again, you could argue, oh, maybe I'm selecting a certain point, but this is at the end of a long run. It's not like these guys just started up here, whatever. This is the end of stage two. You have the Pinsky Brigade. You have Hendrick Cars, Trackhouse, Stenhouse. You have Logano, Ford Brigade, Elliott, 
um, Keselowski, Toyota, you know, all the Toyotas together with Legacy Car, Justin fucking Haley, Kyle Busch. If I'm not mistaken, that's Kyle Busch. Uh, like, hey, man, all the good guys are up there. You have all the Joe Gibbs cars within, I mean, yet again, in this picture we have the top 20 or whatever, but you can see where people are going to be at, where people are going to go. I also want to add that uh, Jones got on the wall late in the race, but I think the two best cars in this race, four best cars, were Kyle Busch, Eric Jones, Denny Hamlin, and um, probably Suarez by the way they were able to make runs um, throughout the race. I uh, just want to say that as I'm here. But like, and then we start looking at the back of the field of who, where are people just riding? You have two Spire cars, whether it's Haley, LaJoy, it doesn't matter. I don't remember who this guy is. Shout out to this big boy. Um, got another legacy car. You got Gregson, 31, Busher, just because he wasn't able to get up to the front. He's got to ride. You have believe that's aj or whoever the 16 is then there's hamlin okay so like that's the end of the main pack right like all the good all the good cars all the good teams who have speed are up in the pack right and then the guys who are lacking in the back the other spire car barry uh not sure who that is you have bubba wallace who also wrote in the back um like if you're not up there you're just not up there don't know who this guy is but like we can easily determine like where people want to ride in these races right and and you know i'll just let this play in the background um like, I think that's the first part of being able to predict where people are run or are going to run in these races. As I've stated time and time again, my approach is trying to predict where people are going to run in these races and work backwards, okay, for when they wreck or run into issues, you know, we can figure out who who is more likely to be involved in those crashes, okay? Now, take a step back and look at, you know, Daytona which was probably one of the most tilting experiences I've ever had in DFS, which some people might view it as, you know, oh, that's just plate racing. Oh, why are you looking like whatever the case may be? The fact that I've taken down quite a few plate racing contests, in my opinion, speaks, you know, f- you know for itself there. But entering the last green-white checkered this past race at, at, at Daytona, I was winning all the contests, okay? No duplicated lineups, just all guys from the back at lower lower ownership, and whatnot, and by the time you know the checkered fell, you know we just two x their money, turned you know five hundred into a thousand. Um, so that was like really, really disappointing, um, just by the huge swing of things. But yet again, I think that would argue that I mean at that point you're letting Jesus take the will, right? But being able to understand where people are running, as I said, and I've mentioned this in previous videos as well uh, on my old channel of like watching where these guys run and almost all the time you're going to see you're going to see Stenhouse you're going to see Haley you're going to see teams or guys up here that just typically run up front all day or you you can we can we can identify where these guys are going to run um and anyway I'm just I mean I'm just kind of talking out loud but I'm just showing what uh just some things to note that I saw firsthand um and the fact that we're going to Talladega which when we yet again I mean I can argue when to use Atlanta data or not. I don't typically like to have it on a spreadsheet, but I like to at least keep it visually in my mind because at Atlanta, you are you have to be protective of the outside lane. Okay, uh, We saw Kyle Busch and Ty, Ty Gibbs both throw away this win at Atlanta because they went to the bottom at the end of the race, which in these cars, momentum is such a huge thing that when you look at Daytona and Talladega, you can't block the runs, right? But at Atlanta, you, you can a little bit more than, than normal, okay, because handling is so big and because the, the top side is going to be so dominant, you know. You know, you even look back at, like, how Austin Hill won his race, or do you want to argue or not, race dirty or not, like, he fences a guy on his outside because if he lets him get to the outside, he's going to pass him, okay? Like, everybody has to fight for the outside. Whereas at Talladega and Daytona, it's much more of a momentum-based um, standpoint or, you know, momentum based type of, uh, of racing ordeal. And when you look at these tracks, you look at the room that people have to maneuver at Talladega. I would argue that in terms of friendliness towards skill level and friendliness towards where people should finish, I would argue that Talladega should be first because if you're good at understanding the air, 
good at packing air in other people's cars, good at maintaining momentums, good at controlling lineups, you like not lineups, lines, you should be able to perform very, very well at Talladega. Second would be Atlanta. Okay, just due to the fact that handling is coming more into play there than uh, Talladega. And then at the bottom would be Daytona, because Daytona, you are very limited in terms of racing room, uh, in, you know, the, the width of the track, and your ability to make moves that aren't going to be countered nearly as much. And when I say that, you know, especially in these next-gen cars, we're seeing that the air is freaking huge, okay? The fact that these guys are going to be side-sucking each other, and especially getting on the right rear of one another... Um, that's why the outside lane is usually so powerful, and you need a lot of assistance on the bottom because anytime the two lanes come together, it's helping the outside lane more. When that car is dumping air on the car on the inside lane, you know, it's slowing them down, and you're carrying more momentum through the outside. Now, and yet again, you know, this is kind of just me talking or whatever, but when we look at the potential changes to the car's that they are that they are talking about for this weekend at Atlanta or this weekend at Talladega, and this is yet again speculative on my part because I'm not an engineer, okay? But I have talked to many people who are much smarter smarter than me and understand aerodynamics a lot more than me. Ironically, you know, I have my P51 Mustang shirt on, but um, very very similar in terms of this type of stuff, in terms of aircraft and what the wind is doing to the cars. Okay, so this is a two-part discussion I want to have. One, I want to argue the fact that the car is flipping over in this. Yeah, sure, you know, my, my still image of, you know, this car wasn't ready or whatever still matters. But when we look at the easiness that this car is flipping over, you know, a lot of, you know, miscalculations, whatever, like just failure above, you know, in, in terms of a lot of things. But... The one area that I would honestly not be concerned of, and I'm removing the trolling crews and all that stuff, like talking about cars going upside down, this is probably the safest car for that, in a sense. Now, you're going to argue what happened to Priest. I would argue that this is probably the safest car we've had when it goes upside down, because the issue that we've seen in previous generations of cars is that the fucker wants to fly, Okay. Now you're going to be like, but this car, it's like, a, it's like an airplane wing, Brandon. Look at the bottom of this car. It's sealed off. Yes, but when these cars roll over, they in, once it takes off, that wing literally acts like a wing and it forces the car back down on its roof. Okay? We we saw it literally in the first race of this car when Harrison Burton rolled over. Harrison Burton rolled over. You know, LaJoy self-spins himself and, and just blows himself over on accident. You know, we're having a lot of blowovers in this, in this car, but this car is coming down very fast and not gain a ton of speed. You know, Priest's crash isn't even that bad if he doesn't hit the grass. Like, whatever. Like, truly, whatever. I'm pissed they removed the grass, but that's what uh, what happened. If, it, if the grass isn't there, he comes down, he just slides, right? Josh Berry. When Berry went upside down, car went on the air. Our car went down on the ground, okay? We're, we're not tearing cars up, or we're not, like, sending cars up into the stands. A lot of the discourse online is about, what if we bring one of these cars over the catch fence? You know, hey, what if we what if we flip on tri oval? I don't think I don't I don't think I'm not too worried about it, honestly. I'm really not concerned, okay? The reason being you look at the neck you look at the Gen 6, like when Logano tipped over or flipped over, when Brennan Poole, not Brennan Poole, when Brennan Gone flipped over, you know, when Matt Kenseth flipped over, when that car would get upside down, that car is vertical. Okay? Massive, massive height, massive gap between the bottom of the car and the racing surface okay that car real chance to do some damage right um but we look at how this car is flipping over and i don't think it's nearly as bad and i'm not very concerned about actually killing fans in this car okay real talk real brand that's just where i'm at i'm not very concerned about this car flipping over now, with that said, talking about the changes that they potentially might make this week, which I think they will, okay, I don't know if you've heard of this man here, but his name is, I gotta bring this up, hold on, um, where are we at here, uh, Bozai, Bozy, um, this fellow here on Twitter, um, now, I'm not exactly sure how he's able to do this. I'm not exactly sure what uh, information he has. Like, it's very close to sources. Anytime Bozzy leaks something, 
it's typically very close to what's happening, okay? He's been accurate more than enough times for me to be like, okay, yeah, cool. Uh, I, I kind of trust if there's any leaks coming from him, I'm not too concerned about him. So the reason I'm bringing this up is they or he is um, talking about the potential changes that they can bring or that they are deci- that they are looking to bring a Talladega. And yet again, and this is Monday morning. If they don't change anything, this, this is kind of a mute point. But I think this is worth discussing here. Now, yet again, these are just his renders. He does not have any of uh, any of the things the teams might be getting. This is just his understanding of how you know it would look, and he's explaining where things are. But reason I'm bringing this up is, yet again, it's not the finished product. It's just kind of what he's imagining or what he's thinking from what he's hearing, right? Now, I just stated on how these drivers are able to put air on each other's car, the aggressiveness, especially of these, you know, the new shark fins that they added to the back, uh, following um, the wrecks that um, we saw in Michigan that they implemented for Daytona, which we would argue we typically had two flips, basically. You know, if McDowell gets turned sideways like that on a straightaway, he's flipping over. Okay. My thoughts here let's talk about it from a racing perspective or a setup perspective when you're adding a a a pretty substantial i'm going to use the word wing here it's not a wing but a vertical surface okay and you look at this in terms like airplane or aircraft and stuff this is going to be a pretty significant change of the balance of the car okay because this is basically introducing another plane that the air is going to you know basically have to go over and against in these cars and if it's on the right side Okay, what is that doing to the outside lane in this race? What is this doing to how cars are maneuvering in this race? I think this is going to change either good or bad. We don't have that because, I mean, we, we, you know, we don't test this stuff anymore. We just throw it in the sims and see what happens. Like, gone are the days we're crashing like 747s in, in the fucking salt flats to see, you know, how things, you know, how changes might or may not, you know, affect how, how a fucking plane crashes, right? We're just doing this all, we're just doing all this stuff in, in, in Sims and everything. And my thoughts when it comes to this is handling might be way more important at Talladega than it has been, okay? Because when I see this, I see a car that has a real potential to be, and yet again, we, do, we don't have practice, so they're just throwing this on. Good luck, drivers. Go ahead and cue. We're going to find out in the race. Um, there's a real chance that this fin is going to upset the cars pretty aggressively in situations to where somebody's making an aggressive move either up or down the track. Going straight or maintaining your line, not a concern. It's a vertical wing, right? But when you start tilting it, you know, you go down the track to make a block. You go up the track to make a block. Hell, you might get bumped a little sideways and you get a little wiggly and stuff. Um, I was talking to, to some of my friends and she was explaining that this could very much be a potential or be very similar to the really trimmed off Hendrick cars of the early 2010s or like mid 2010s in, in, in the Gen 6, you know, Dell Jr.'s Amelia, the trucks that Jimmy Johnson or the cars that Jimmy Johnson would bring to Daytona uh, and the cars that Hendrick would bring, you know, to where like they were super stable by themselves and they were super stable leading a line. But as soon as they got in any dirty air or as soon as they got turned, you know, not even perpendicular, but kind of against how the wind was working in the draft, like those guys just got so loose. It was like uncontrollable, right? Um, So like here, if you got like a massive lean towards wind or like, you know, with the addition of this, um, like how is that going to upset the car exiting the corners? How is that going to change the car when you're making tight, drastic maneuvers, especially that you have to do in this car when you're blocking runs or gaining speed or whatever you get bumped like i'm i'm particularly worried about corner entry and corner exit uh with 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 this change here also yet again it's on the right side what is this and yet again he, he talks about how you know they're um you know talking about how his understanding is like you know they're they're replacing these pieces with a taller piece and also adding a part to the windshield um visibility concerns like who gives a shit now doesn't care but Depending on how big this is, this is gonna affect this is gonna affect how airflow is being dumped on the back of the car, on how it's slowing down cars, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I think there's a chance that you know this race could potentially either be two extremes of you know being super green and 
this making the cars either easier to handle or it's going to upset the cars and we potentially see more unstable cars, especially from faster teams who are going to be up front. Or if you're like fourth, fifth, sixth line and sixth car in line, you know, you, hell, you might start pushing out of the corners. Like, the, you know, that's a real concern. Secondly, from a, uh, you know, real standpoint, now, I grant, like they're not going to like go over the fucking roof rail or the, the, the you know, the, the, uh, the roof flap, right? But this air changes a lot of the top of the car. Like, if this car gets spun sideways, right, depending on how the air is going to roll over, because yet again, I'm, not, I'm just speaking out loud here, right? Depending on how they implement this stuff, this might negate the roof flaps. Like, this, this has not been tested. We have already seen in this car that the roof flaps have failed to deploy, depending on how fast the car goes around or depending on what angle they're at. Real chance here this is going to negate part of the roof flaps and the ability for them to be activated. So, like, that that's where I'm at. Um, that's kind of my points. I think we can have a, at least a civil or educated discussion on this instead of just being like, oh, they're adding roof. They're adding shark fins to the car. It's changing. Like, I just look at it, like, all, all on that standpoint. Like, what does it do to the setup? How does it potentially change how air is deployed to the car when guys, when guys are side by side? When people are coming down the track to side suck somebody and then they pull away from them? Like, what is that doing to these cars? <laughs> Basically adding, like, another you know, plane that the air has to go over on, on the right side of the car. And how does the car act when it gets spun sideways? You know, maybe not even flipping over, but like how easy is it for the drivers to save it? Does this add kind of like something they can lean on? Because typically you could use the right rear back in the day, or at least, you know, on the old car to kind of save you when you got spun sideways. We don't really have that now. But does this make the car tighter? Does it make it go up the track easier like if you get spun sideways do you just get tight and hit the wall now you know a lot of unknowns and i think this is a pretty significant thing to talk about entering this race um and i just want to get that out because i doubt anybody else is going to is going to talk about that um part on on this car uh as we move over and discuss the stack from the back situation as i would implore you to do uh as in any plate race that is what i would suggest you do um, the fact that we will have smaller contests, you know, only 8,000 for the big one. Uh, I'm assuming trucks will probably be like four or five. You know, we might have, we might have six for Saturday's event. Um, but I think you want to stack on the back. I think the truck rate, truck race specifically, no excuses. Play 24th on back, play 25th on back, 85 laps. Okay. We're probably going to lose at least 20 of those, 25 of those to yellows. Uh, so we might only have you know, 52 fast lap laps available, if not less, uh, full on play the guys in the back from the truck series. No excuse not to do that. I, I think you'd be what a terrible approach if you're not doing that. Um, Xfinity, you know, as we move on and there was worry in the forecast. I mean, yet again, this is Monday. I'm not too concerned about the weather at all at Talladega uh, this weekend. Anything can change, but I'm, I got nothing to really worry about at the moment. So I don't think we see a race shortened or a threat of weather at the moment. Um, but Xfinity has gotten more and more crazy. We have seen, like, you know, it, it's been a while since we've had guys get incredibly dumb. You know, we had a lot of wreck cars in the spring, which we typically don't have. Um and the fact that it is a playoff race, the fact that we have three races in the fall at Talladega is, is crazy enough. Like, we, you know, typically never have that. So, thank God we have that this year. Um, kind of had that on-off since COVID. But before that, it was just two two races in the fall. So, that's that's good. Um, and the fact that we're going to lose slower cars in Q. You know, there's Yorgo Homers in both bottom races. And there's 40 cars in the Cup Series, Okay. 40 cars in the Cup Series, which with a new addition that we don't exactly know what's going to happen. Um, I mean, I've already talked about the Cup Series in, in, in you know throughout this video, but um, Xfinity, like we're probably going to lose the slowest car. We're probably going to have a lot of slow teams in the back: the Joey Gazes, the Alpha Beta Primes, the um, I'm trying to think of who else typically starts in the back off the top of my head. Um, but we're seeing typically a lot of the slower teams are qualifying in a group in the Xfinity series. Okay. And so, yes, I'm targeting guys in the back and I'm not going out of my way to do this, but I'm finding myself running a lot of team stacks with the 
back markers and the people that typically run the back of the field. And I think Xfinity is super, super in play for that. You know, when I look back at the at the win I had in Talladega in, in the spring, it was pretty much, you know, just stacking teams in the back. Uh, and not teams in terms of drivers, teams in terms of same trailer, same same shop, same people. Um, so w- whether that's just circumstantial of how people are qualifying, whatever the case may be, but I think that's a really good avenue. Um, focusing and letting... The good teams, Joe Gibbs, RCR, Junior Motorsports, letting them be owned by the public, letting them race as dumb as they want to race and tear shit up up there, that's perfectly fine. We're not targeting them. We're not trying to target people who are going to project to finish well, who are going to project to run up top. We're just looking for crashes, okay? And time and time again, at least I've been able to do, to do that correctly, um, and that's why I enjoy these races because we can... And that's why I like talking about stuff. That's why I like talking about this because these are... These are my best races. Um, and then when we, look, when we look at the Cup Series, we're seeing that, I mean, Spire's taking a pretty big uptick, okay? Pretty big uptick in terms of performance. We're seeing that Legacy is pretty much bottom of the barrel, but they're being held on by the Toyotas. The Cup Series specifically is very dependent on what the qualifying lineup is in terms of how I personally approach it, in terms of how aggressive I am on the lower owned guys. If it's just lower owned people in the back, that's fine. Okay. We don't have to worry about that. If we have good teams in in terms of, we don't have to worry about somebody being owned beyond belief, right? You know, anywhere from like 28, you know, like 19%, whatever. Um, like that, that's not a concern. But once we start getting good people in the back to, or like good teams in like a Joe Gibbs car or a Hendrick car or whatever, that changes the outcome of the slate pretty dramatically. Not only are you have are we having to deal with the ownership that follows that driver, but we're also having to deal with the percentage of times that they're going to be the best scoring driver on the slate. So, honestly, I probably prefer races to where everybody qualifies where they should, than you know so and so blows up you know leaving pit lane on a Q lap or whatever. Um, so that's where I'm at for the Cup Series. Yet again, stacking in the back. But I, I mean, I, th- I think the wing is going to be pretty substantial. I think handling, now Talladega is glass smooth, right, compared to, you know, Daytona and, and Atlanta. Um, but I think handling is going to be pretty significant. I think especially, you know, out of turn four and out of turn two, uh, I think we have a potential of, of handling being much more important than it has been where, you know, we're slowly aging this track more and more. It's getting to the point to where I, th- I think that is something we have to start considering at Talladega. And what I mean by that is we have a chance of possibly wrecking more and more people up front. Um, and I'm not just saying that for like a like a propaganda standpoint of, hey, you know, play guys in back. I'm just, you know, thinking out loud and, and seeing what I'm noticing. Um, Atlanta, we saw a lot of guys plowing tight, like f- tight as all fuck, man, in the corners. Which is, you know, we at least I anticipated that as we looked, or as I previewed the race, but it was way more than normal, way more than, than what I expected. And then we looked at the struggles that the teams had at, at Daytona, and we tore a lot of shit up at Daytona, and which is on par, but still kind of even more so than I thought we would. And I think there's real chances we do that again at Talladega. I think there's real chances that. A lot of these crashes are going to fly up the track. Now, Grant, yeah, sure, and what is Charlie anyway? But man, I'm really concerned about playing teams that are going to be up front, uh, probably more so than normal. I'd be more cautious to do that than normal. Even if you're chasing the optimal lineup, I think this is a weekend to where we we uh, really don't want to do it in trucks, don't want to do it in, in Xfinity, even with you know the percentage that it does go that way in Xfinity Series races. But for the Cup Series, like I think you got to move the mark back. Typically, I was at least always open, like, starting from 12 and back. I think it's 15, maybe 18 on back. I think there's a chance for a lot of a lot of carnage to happen in this race and a lot of guys to flip-flop positions, okay? Um, so that's kind of my Talladega preview. Not really anything, you know, DFS-wise. Like, we didn't look at optimal lineups. I don't think I need to, to show that at this point. Um, you know, I think we've we, we all understand the gist here, but... I got to say, man, I think that wing is going to add a lot to this race. Um, 
A lot, lot to handling, a lot of how the draft is going to work. I don't, I can't figure it out right now in my head if it's going to negate the two lines having a chance to run side by side. Uh, even if, like, I mean, we've had, like, the fuel mileage issues, right? And hopefully, you know, Keselowski and other guys will go ahead and force these fuckers to run so they don't save fuel. Um, but I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of worried about the outside line being OP here. I really am. If you think about how the air is working off of the outside line car, if you're on the top and you're by the wall, you already get the you know kind of air gap between the wall and you that you know you're pushing the air off, and it's just against the wall. And yeah, sure, that might drag you down a little bit, but with that tall shark fin, you know, on the right side, I don't think that's as I don't think it's a I don't think it's a big worry if you're against the wall, but I'm really concerned about the outside lane being OP in in this Talladega race and the middle and the sucker hole being uh, fucking screwed for for sure. The middle, I I think I think there's a real chance the middle is really nerfed in this race. Um Yet again, we don't have practice, we don't have any way to test this stuff. This is just going off of gut feel. Um, and kind of where I'm at, maybe, you know, my points are mute. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys, some people will be like, well, then, you know, if we're not going to wreck, do we just play guys up front, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like I, you know, I don't have the answers to that. I'm going to do my approach of playing guys in the back of the field anyway, but I think handling is going to be really important. And I think we're going to see a bit of a different, I think we're going to see this car act a bit different in the draft when they're side by side with people. Um, and I think that's that's something to note. Um, if it does go top line, choo choo train style, should be the good teams up top. Should be the good. It should easily. It should be more projectable than normal. If if it's like straight up, you should be able to project people within like four or five positions of where they should be at any given point in the race, and especially coming down to the end. If we don't have wrecks through stage one and stage two. And projections should be pretty easy to do. Um, so this might, from a not a sim based from contests, but a sim based or projectable standpoint of thinking of how people are going to perform and where they're going to be at in the car. I think this race has a chance of being more projectable than normal. And I say that because Atlanta seemed like that to me. Entering the race, building projection. Yet again, you know, Hamlin didn't get his wreck, and he and he rode in the back all day. That's fine. I know for a fact. I you know, I because I predict Hamlin for like tenth. He finished like fucking twentieth or whatever, twenty ninth. Um, but people who were up front, or people teams that should have been up front, people that were in good team, people that should have been up front were up, were at front at, at Atlanta. People who should have been up front were at fr- up front were up front at Daytona. So I think it should be pretty easy to project where people should finish without yellows at Talladega, which is the baseline that my projections are based off of when I'm analyzing how to build my lineups. Because if I know where people are going to be up front, I can determine who to play in the back that should take advantage if and when those guys wreck up front. Um, So those are kind of all my thoughts for this week at Atlanta. Yet again, maybe not necessarily a, a DFS preview because I didn't really show anything here. I'm just speaking out loud of, of my personal approach and things I'm thinking of entering this Talladega weekend. Um, but though that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, I don't know if it helps you. I don't know if it will hurt you. But that you know, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you guys in the live shows Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, this week. And thank you for watching. And best of luck. And see you guys later. Bye-bye.